need you to give me the prime factors of 12. Right, the prime factors. So we're gonna, I want to allude with a little topic that's really all what 4-4 is about. Okay, but it's a really quick one. So prime factors of 12, what would you do? Break it up. Um, you can break it down to 3 times 4. And okay. 3 is like already a prime number. So we're done. So the prime factorization of 12 would be 2 times 2 times 3. Does this maybe ring a bell in your head from anything you've done? Have you seen this ever? Because this, this idea of factoring is going to be what we're talking about now, but we have to understand what prime factorization really is. All right, so breaking something into its smallest components of factors. So try on your own real quick to break up, let's say... Uh, 48. Take 48 and break it into its prime factors. And there's one right answer, but there are several ways to get to that answer. So whatever way you choose is fine. All right, somebody want to respond with the way they did it? What do you got, Paul? All right. Very good. So Paul notices four twos and a three. Whatever's at the end of your tree are your prime factors. So 48 is really 2 to the 4th times 3. And that makes sense. Because 2 to the 4th is 16. And 16 times 3 is 48. So when we break things into their prime factors, we do this so that we know what it's made up of. So that we can find a common factor. So the numbers 12, or the number 12 and 48. What would the common factors be in 12 and 48? And I'll write this one in blue. This would be 2 to the second times 3. Right from here. And this goes over here. What would the common factors be? Be careful with your answer here. What would the common factors be with these? 12, 14, 3. What is it? 12, 4, 2, and 3. 12, 4, 2, and 3. Okay. They are all common factors because they all go into all of them. All right. What are the common factors that are prime? I should specify what I want because you're right. You're absolutely right. What are the prime common factors? What is it? Two and three. Two and three. Now, how many twos are common? Uh, two. two of them, right? Notice, there's two times two times three. This is two times two times two times two times three. So if I looked at this, I could see that this is really two times two times two times two times three. I can think of it that way. And I can think of this as 2 times 2 times 3. So the factors that are in common are the ones that appear in both. Okay, so this, these other 2's out here, these are not common factors. So at the end of the day, as Ryan alluded to, 2 times 2 is 4, 4 times 3 is 12. So 12 would be the greatest common factor. That's how you find the GCF when it comes to numbers. But we're going to apply this to variables now. So if you wanted to find the GCF between 12 and 48, well, it's just 12. Because 12 goes into 12, and 12 goes into 48. What about this? Find the greatest common factor of the two numbers 45 and 63. And do this, please, using prime factorization. Please do this using prime factorization. So you got all the prime factors you have. and see which ones are in common.
And again, you could say, approach this differently. You could do 21 times 3, right, over here. And you could do 15 times 3 over here. I chose 9 times 5 and 9 times 7. But whatever you break it up into, it doesn't matter as long as you keep going. But at the end, what are the common factors in both? 3 and 3, right? 3 times 3 is here, and 3 times 3 is here. So what's the greatest common factor then? 9. Okay? So the GCF of these two numbers would be 9. So the GCF is really the product of all the prime factors that occur in both. Okay? 3 and 3 occur here, and 9 is the GCF. 3 and 3 occur here, and 9 is the GCF. Now, let's take this and extrapolate this idea, all right, into variables where we have expressions that have more than one term in them. Okay? Now, in reference to a polynomial, we talked about numbers a moment ago. In a polynomial, greatest common factor is a factor that's in all terms in the polynomial, in every single term. And that's something that can be pulled out in front. So let's take a look at it. So we have 6x to the third minus 15x squared. And we want to find the GCF in this problem. Think about this again as prime factorization. This would really be 3 times 2 times x times x times x minus 3 times 5 times x times x. Again, once you're good at this, obviously you're not going to do this every time, right? You can see it. But this is what you should be visualizing in your head. Sabine, what factors are in common in both of these? 2, 3, 2, and? Uh, sorry. 3, 3, and x squared. Good. Sorry, not 2, x squared. So if I look, I can see what I've underlined is in both terms. So that means the greatest common factor is 3x squared. Now, some of you obviously already could see that just by looking up here, and that's good. You should. Okay, but if you haven't seen this idea before, this is physically what you're doing. So then you take what's underlined, put it out in front like this. Okay, take whatever you underlined, put it out in front. Then, take what's left over and put it in the parentheses. So if I take out a 3x squared, I'm physically doing this. Tell me, Mike, what's left over in this first term when I pull out 3x and x? Well, I'm going to put a minus sign in the middle here instead. You could take out a negative 3x squared if you wanted to, sure. But then it would make the first term negative, right? So I'm going to leave the first term as a positive leading coefficient. But it would definitely be a minus in the middle here. But Mike, answer the question. What's left when I get rid of the 3, the x, and the x? What's left here? 2x. And what's left on the other side? And I can check that that's right. How, how do I know that that's right? What can I do mentally? Redistribute it, please. You just did factoring, which is really the undistributive property, like the anti distributive, if you will. Just redistribute it to see if you're right. So 3x squared times 2x gives you 6x to the third. That's right. 3x squared times negative 5 gives you negative 15x squared. So when you're ever finding the greatest common factor, when in doubt, just factor it all out. Take the, the prime factorization of all the terms and see what's in both of them, and then say what's left over. All right? Now, that's one way of approaching the problem. Let's take a look at another way of approaching the problem, where we can see what the answer is in our head, okay? And then we can say, all right, well, let's take a look at this now and see what's left behind. So example two. First, I want you to recall that the difference of two squares, we did this in the last section. When you have something where they're binomial conjugates as products, you end up getting a squared minus b squared. And this came about because those middle terms canceled when we did the FOIL method or double distributive on this. So look at part A. Look at part A and try and go backwards now using that law of difference of two squares. Instead of multiplying factors, now you're going to take an answer and break it up into its factors. So what factors would give you u squared minus 49 when you multiply them by one another? u minus 7 times u plus 7. How are you getting that, Charles? Well, you're correct. First, you have to get rid of the middle term, so you can't have two negatives. Okay. And u squared, you break it down into two u's, and 7, like the square root is... Uh, 49 is greater than 7. Good. Okay. 
Once we identify that, we now have A and B. So when you have something where it looks like it's a difference of two squares, think about what each of those squares would be. Well, it's u squared minus 7 squared. Therefore, therefore u is really a, and 7 is really what b is. Okay, 7 is really the place of b. And we know the formula for dots is a plus b, a minus b, or a minus b, a plus b. So we have, this is really a minus b, a plus b. Because again, this is A, and this is really B. So you're identifying the bases, really. Right? You're identifying the bases by writing them in this exponential form, where it's 7 squared instead of 49. So before I get to choice or option B, how about this one? What would that one look like? If I were to factor this one. Ben, what do you got? Yeah, and we see again, they're squares, so we just look at the square roots of them. So we think about this as x squared minus 5 squared, really. So this is A, and this is B. This goes in for A here and here, and this goes in for B here and here. And I literally just apply the rule at the top of the page up there, A minus B, A plus B. Okay, now, part B. Part B looks like it doesn't work at first. But there's something about part B that makes it work. What can I do for part B before I go into difference of two squares? What can I take out instead first, Luca? 5x. Very good. The GCF is 5x here. So let's take a look at this one. X, 5x cubed minus 20x. It looks like they're not difference of two squares, and I agree. You know, there's no way you would see that right away. But your first step in all factoring problems is always GCF. Always, 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 always is see if there's a GCF. 20 breaks up into 5 times 4, so 5 is clearly here, and 5 is here. X is here, and there's three different X's here, X times X times X. So if I were to factor this out, I could write the prime factorization, or I could just take out 5X. Now. Without the prime factorization there, how do you know what's left over? There's a real simple trick. Real simple. It's not even a trick, really. It's just an operation you can do mentally. No, the question was, how do I, what's the quick, the quick operation or trick I can use this with this to figure out what's left behind? Something you don't always think about, but this is actually how factoring really works. You can divide, I guess. Yeah, divide by the GCF. Watch. Divide this by 5x. 5 cancels with 5, doesn't it? x cubed divided by x gives you? x squared. x squared. Well, that's what's left here. Then take the 5x and divide it into 20x, which gives you? Yeah, the 4 there, and we carry down the negative sign. So please, write this note on the side if you haven't seen that before. When you take a GCF out, to see what's left behind, just divide the GCF into all the terms of the original. Again, divide the GCF into all the terms of the original to see what's left behind. And again, you can always check this by redistributing. Now do you see difference of two squares? Is it more apparent now? Where is there difference of two squares in this one? What's left behind that has difference of two squares in it? What factor, Charles? X squared minus 4 squared. Yeah, this is really difference of two squares. This is really x squared minus, and 4 is really 2 squared. Whenever this is a perfect square here, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, 100, any perfect square. When these are perfect squares, you can automatically factor them that way. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go ahead, leave the 5x alone, obviously, and I'm going to break this up into its two respective terms. Paul, what would those two terms be when I factor this now? Uh, Doesn't matter which one first. Yeah, x plus four. Not four. What's the square root of four, remember? Oh, uh, two. Two. Okay, be careful. Remember, this is really, right, isn't this really two squared? And whatever the base is, is what goes in here and here. Okay? 
So that is the final answer. 5x times the quantity x plus 2 times the quantity x minus 2. I don't need that there, believe it or not, because there's no... It would only be if there was a plus sign in here that that extra parenthesis would matter, because remember, multiplication is commutative. Okay, it doesn't matter the order in which I multiply these. So I don't need the parentheses in this case. Okay, but if there were a plus sign, definitely, you need that parentheses to know to distribute. Remember, to get back to the original, you're not distributing 5x anymore. I would multiply these factors, and that would give you x squared minus 4. Then you would distribute the 5x. Okay? How about part C? Part C is a little tricky. Part C says 25r to the 6th minus 36. 25r to the 6th minus 36. Kelly, step us through this. Well, first you would break down like them. Like, Into their perfect squares? Yeah. All right, so what's the first one look really, really? Okay, and what about the second one? So, yeah. So do you see what Kelly did here? Take a look, please. She said to herself, well, although it doesn't look like difference of two squares, you could make 36 six squared. That's obvious. It's a perfect square. Well, 25 is a perfect square also. It turns out that any variable to an even power is a perfect square. Think about it for a second. R to the eighth. Isn't that R to the fourth to the second? Because 4 times 2 is 8. R to the 10th is R to the 5th to the 2nd. I'm going to write this down so you see it. Okay, side note. R to the, we did 6th already. R to the 8th is really R to the 4th squared. R to the 10th is really R to the 5th squared. R to the 20th is really R to the 10th squared. So in the end, whenever you have an even exponent, it's a perfect square. You might want to write that down just so you know, okay? Whenever you have an even exponent, it can be made into a perfect square. How do you do it? You simply divide the exponent by 2. 20 becomes 10, 10 becomes 5, 8 becomes 4, and they're perfect squares as results. So it turns out that this now is A, and this is B. Again, remember, we're trying to get this into the form a squared minus B squared. Whenever we're looking at dots, we try to get into A squared minus B squared. This is A, 5R cubed, quantity squared, minus B, which is 6 squared. So A is 5R cubed, B is 6. And I know that my answer is always A plus B, A minus B. So I write, ready? A, that's A, plus B, which is 6, times a minus b. So this is the factorization of 25r to the 6th minus 36. I know some of you have seen this before, and I know it's a little bit tedious, but I want you to really understand that I'm identifying a and b. Because in a moment, we're going to see stuff that's a lot more difficult than this, and it helps to identify a and b first. So if you've done this before and you're just used to doing it, that's great, that's good. But if you haven't done it by identifying A and B and saying A goes here, B goes here, A goes here, B goes here, try to consider that fact because it's going to help with the next thing. All right, practice one on your own. Let's try, let's try the following. Let's say, I don't, I don't want to repeat something I did already. Hold on. Okay. Let's try 9 25ths. Notice they're both, they're both what? Perfect squares, right? 25, uh, 9 25 u to the 4th minus 81 y squared. Either go right to the answer or start by identifying a and b and then plug them in where they go accordingly.
Check your first line to see if you have the same thought process as me first. So when looking at this problem, we notice that 9 25 is a perfect square of 3 fifths. And u to the fourth is really u squared squared. So we start by identifying this as a, and this is b. And we know that our answer is always a plus b, a minus b. So a plus b is the first factor. And then the binomial conjugate of that. A minus b. Any questions on this? Does that make sense? I know it's a trickier one, but the idea is that you want to identify everything as perfect squares, then identify a and b so you know what goes into the factor form of this one. There's another type of factoring I want to get into today called grouping. Has anyone heard of grouping before? Grouping. Do you remember the idea behind grouping? Do you want to give a quick analysis of what you're going to do? I okay. So you're looking at individual terms within several terms. Okay, so we're going to arrange them in a certain way. Let's look. Look at example A. Group them by things that are common. What do you notice is in both of the first two terms? Y. So group these together for a second. And what GCF is in both of these terms? Two. So start with the first one by taking a Y out of the first two terms. If I take a Y out of here, what's left? Anybody? X. If I take a y out of here, what's left? Good, three. Then I go over to the other side, and I see that two is in both of these, the number two. So I start by taking a two out, and I have to carry down my sign, please. I'm taking out a positive two. And what's left behind conveniently again? x plus three again is left behind. So we look at this now. So we've taken out GCS of those two individual groups, and now there's a GCF that's in both of these terms. X plus 3 is in both of these. This whole thing is one group, or one uh, term. This is the other term. They both have X plus 3 in them, so take X plus 3 out in front now. So factor out X plus 3 in front. And if you do that, you're left behind. And remember the trick. If you factor out X plus 3, divide this by X plus 3, leaving you with just Y. Divide this by x plus 3, leaving with a 2. So you're left with y plus 2. So this would be the factor form of part A. So grouping works sometimes. Remember, not all expressions can be factored. So if you cannot factor it, then don't force it. Follow what I'm saying? Then maybe you can manipulate it to make it work. That's different. But if it's not factorable, then you just can't factor And we talk about what is unfactorable solve them, we go into either graphing or quadratic formula and different things. Okay, but if you can factor it, go ahead and do it, it just makes it easier like that. Factoring is really important to solve equations that are polynomials. Okay, that's the real reason we factor. It's for solving equations. How about part B? Try part B on your own, please. Part B is a little tricky. If you 
you'd like, you're welcome to switch some of the terms around. You could reorder them. I'm trying to use your name. Or you can do it the way it is. It still works, but it's a little tricky to do it the way it is. So feel free to reorder them or try and attempt it this way. What do you have in the first two terms? If, if you left it this way, if you reordered it, it might look different. If you left it this way, what comes out of the first two? What's the GCF in these two? 2R. Because 10 is really 5 times 2. So if I divide the first term right here by 2R, what goes here as a result? Divide this by 2R. Mike? Good. So Mike noticed, divide this, you get 5R, divide this, you get W. Now, remember, whatever shows up in the next parentheses needs to be the same thing, doesn't it? For this to work. So what you do is this. Start by putting your parentheses here, and put the 5R plus W here. And think to yourself, what do you have to factor out of here to make that 5R plus W? Because it's currently not 5R plus W. Negative 1. You gotta factor out a negative one there to get this to work. That's why I said it's a little trick. As a result now, 5R plus W is common in both terms. You did it the other way. Did you get the same answer then? I got it. Yeah, you get the switched around, but it's the same. So when I take out the 5R plus W, I'm left with 2R minus 1, and that's my answer. Let's do it the other way. Okay, let's take, what did you mix up, the middle two terms, I'm guessing? And negative. W. Tell me your whole what your arrangement was. So read the first line. W H U R minus one. Parentheses two R minus one. Just read the reordered way, though. I mean, how did you reorder it first? Oh, you just did it in your head like that? That's fine. Just what would you reorder it as to make it look differently, so so people can see it's a little more obvious. Ten R squared minus five R plus two R minus three. Yeah. So what I was getting at was what Ryan is doing right here, is he switched the middle two terms there. Okay, and then keep going, Ryan. And then I took the first two terms, and I got 5R over 2 minus 1. Okay, so it's the same exact answer. You're still going to get 5, oops, this is a W, not a... Here. You're still going to get 5R plus W and 2R minus 1. Again, because this is common now. So the only difference is that the common factor in parentheses turned out to be the other term you had a moment ago. So sure, you can switch the order of these two factors and write it the other way, but it's the same answer. Okay, this times this is the same as this times this. It's cumulative. So it doesn't matter which way you write it. All right, does that make sense, grouping? It's a useful technique that is usually overlooked when factoring. Okay, it's usually overlooked. Um, let's do the last part. All right, the last part. Here. If you recall, the difference of squares was a squared minus b squared factors into a plus b, a minus b. That was only a difference of squares. For cubes, it can be the sum or the difference. What does that plus minus sign mean in between there? And then plus minus and minus plus, what's going on there? What is it telling us? And if it's positive, for example, Paul, if I have an example like example A where there's a subtraction, right? Which of these signs am I going to use if it's subtraction? What is it going to factor into? Because I know I have something in this form. That's the general form I'm looking at when it's subtraction. What would that factor into? Okay, subtraction for the first one, 
But take a look at the next symbol. See this symbol here? Since subtraction is the bottom symbol, you use subtraction because that's the bottom symbol. But here, addition is the bottom symbol. So when you're using this formula, you're going to end up using a squared plus ab plus b squared here. Okay, so again, when you're using the difference of squared of cubes, it's a minus then plus. Whereas if this were a positive here, it would be a positive and then a negative over here. Okay, so you need to think about the plus or minus sign and follow it along horizontally. So in part A, let's just do part A for now. In part A, 8x cubed minus 27. Put those in cubes. 8x cubed, what is that really? In perfect cubes. It's something to the third power minus something to the third power, right? What does 8x cubed become when I raise it to the third, when I raise something to the third power? How come you know that? And then what about 27? What cubed gives you 27? 3. So this is really what's happening. This is why I mentioned identifying A and B. This is A. 2x is A. 3 is B. Forget the negative sign. Please forget it. Just apply the rule now. Take A, which is 2x, plug it anywhere you see A. Take B, which is 3, plug it wherever you see B. And keep the signs the way they are in the formula there. So take this A and put it in here. And put it in here, remembering that you're squaring the entire A part. Then take this B, which is 3, and put a 3 here, carrying down the signs. Okay, I can't erase this, unfortunately. I don't know why. So just ignore that scribble, please. So, again, we've got... If I go through the process, a is 2x and b is 3, so this is a minus b. This is a squared, then a times b is really 2x times 3, and then b squared is just 3 squared. So I go ahead and simplify a little further. The quantity 2x squared is what? What's the quantity 2x squared? Yeah, which is 4x squared, really, right? So remember your rules of exponents. That's how we learn that. When you square 2x, square the 2, square the x, you get 4x squared. Then you have 2x times 3, which is 6x, and then plus 9. That would be the answer for part A. Here's what I want you to do tonight. I want you to watch just the last two examples on my video that's already recorded. So look under Mr. Howell's videos in the next section. And watch the last two parts, part B and C. Alright? Make sure you do the homework for this, but make sure you watch the last two parts. Don't just ignore that. So that the next two are a little bit more difficult. Okay, again, these next two are a little bit more difficult, so make sure you do B and C. And then you do the homework for tonight.